Let's talk a little about the paired difference tea procedure. The pooled variance tea or Welch's tea, which we've discussed previously, are appropriate when we have independent samples, but not when we have dependent samples. Consider this example, four students randomly selected from one of my stats courses, and what I've done is taken these four students and got their measurements on the first test and the second test. So the point of interest here, one important point to note, is that this is two measurements on the same student, and this is two measurements on the same student. So we cannot consider these uh, samples from test one and test two to be independent samples, since we have these two measurements on the same person. Anytime there's two measurements on the same person or rock or car or what have you, that's kind of a dead giveaway that we don't have independent samples and that we shouldn't be analyzing things using a pooled variance T or a Welch's T. We do have other situations that are similar to this as well. So a study investigated differences in the volume of the right hippocampus, an area of the brain, in 15 pairs of identical twins. And one twin was affected by schizophrenia and the other was not. And here we have the results. This first pair is representing the volume of a slice of the right hippocampus for these two twins. This first twin did not have schizophrenia. This twin did. And so we have dependent measurements here. They're not the same individual, but there's certainly a tie in there. They're identical twins. So methods based on independent samples are not appropriate here. And to actually do the analysis, it's going to be pretty straightforward for us, though. We take the difference between the observations within each pair and then simply treat those differences as a one-sample problem. And if we've been keeping up to pace and we know our one-sample problems, then this is going to be pretty easy. So my difference here is going to be 1.72 minus 1.55, and I'm going to get 0 0.17. That's my difference for that first pair. I do that for the second pair and the third pair all the way along, and I would also keep the sign. So let's do one where we get a negative difference. Here we get 1.09 minus 1.24, and so that's going to be minus 0 0.15. And we do that all the way along. And if we carried that out for all of those values, we would get what we see here. 15 differences. We've taken differences in all of those pairs, and I get my 15 differences. And once I get those, those 15 differences, I can sort of forget about all of this stuff here. I don't have to worry too much about, about these values. We've got our one sample of differences here now. We've got our 15 differences. N equals 15 differences. And we can carry out our usual one sample inference procedures on those. Those 15 differences had a mean of 0.15 and a standard deviation of 0.195, and I've plotted them out in a box plot here. And I've also drawn in a little line down here at zero, because zero is an important quantity for us here, because we're dealing with the difference between those values. And if your population mean difference is zero, then that's saying there's no difference between those groups on average, or there's no difference between the affected twin and the not affected twin on average in terms of the volume of their right hippocampus. So that's going to be a point of interest for us to investigate that. This box plot looks pretty clean, symmetric, and all the rest of it. There is one outlier up here. It's not overly extreme. It's a little bit out there, but it's not too, too extreme. If we plotted a normal quantile-quantile plot, it wouldn't look too bad. We'd still have that one little outlier, but overall it wouldn't look too bad. So I say let's go ahead with the one-sample T procedures on this. And to do so, we need our standard error. And our standard error of X bar is just our regular old standard error from before, S over the square root of N. And this is simply going to be 0 0.195 over root 15, the number of differences that we have. Then this turns out to be 0 0.050. That is our standard error that we're going to use in our regular old one sample formulas. Now we want a confidence interval. Let's get a confidence interval for the population mean difference. And this formula should look very similar to things we've seen before. It's just our regular old one sample problem uh, formula. We're going to need this t-value, and to do so, we're going to need our degrees of freedom, and our degrees of freedom are just our regular old n minus 1, and that's 15 minus 1, or 14. So I go to a computer or a table, and I get my t-value in the usual way, and I can assume you know how to do that by now, so now we're just doing regular old stuff that we should be very comfortable with. x-bar was 0.150, plus and minus. The computer tells me, or a table, that the appropriate t-value is 2.145. Multiply this by my standard error. And I get 0 0.150 plus and minus 0 0.11.
And if I carry that subtraction out and addition, I get 0 0.04 to 0 0.26. That is a 95% confidence interval for mu, the population mean difference, and I can be 95% confident that mu lies somewhere within that interval. And in the context of this problem, that means we can be 95% confident that the population mean difference for the not affected twin minus the affected twin lies between 0.04 and 0.16 centimeters cubed. We took our differences to be the not affected minus the affected in this situation. So the fact that this interval lies entirely to the right of zero does tell us something. It tells it looks like the twin not affected by schizophrenia has a larger volume of the right hippocampus on average. But we can carry out that line of thinking with a formal hypothesis test. If we want to test the null hypothesis that the population mean difference is zero, that is simply our null hypothesis that mu is equal to zero, and I'm going to choose a two-sided alternative hypothesis here because I don't have any real information one way or another. An expert in the field might think a one-sided one was more appropriate, but I'm choosing a two-sided alternative for us here. And then it's our regular old T procedure, X bar minus the hypothesized value, which is zero, over the standard error of x bar. We've run into this type of thing before. This is just 0 0.150 minus 0 over 0 0.050. And that gives us a t-value of 3.00. To get a p-value, we plot out our t-distribution. 3.00 is out here somewhere. Our degrees of freedom is 14. We figured that out before. And so we want to get the p-value for this two-sided alternative, the area in the tail beyond this test statistic doubled. That tail area doubled because of that two-sided alternative hypothesis. And if we go to a computer or a table, we can see that our p-value is approximately 0 0.01. Our p-value is approximately 0 0.01. What does that tell us? Well, that's a fairly small p-value, and so that's giving pretty strong evidence against that null hypothesis. Or in other words, there's very strong evidence with a two-sided p-value of about 0.01 that the population mean difference mu is actually different from zero. What does that mean in the context of our problem, though? Let's go back and look at the data. Now recall that we were taking our differences to be the not affected twin minus the affected twin here. Not affected minus affected. And what we ended up with for our sample differences was an x bar of 0 0.150. And so the sample mean difference was 0.15 greater than 0. And this gives a strong indication that the twin unaffected by schizophrenia has a larger right hippocampus volume on average. One point to note, these pairs of twins were not a random sample from any larger population, and as such, any generalization to a larger population is a little bit suspect, but it's very, very difficult, say, basically impossible to get a random sample of identical twins in which one has schizophrenia and one does not, and so sometimes we just have to deal with what we have, realize that there may possibly be some biases introduced, but we have to go with what we've got.